the mistakes we all make. You know, we live in a society, in a world today, which, I don't know, seems to me very uh, disturbing. If it wasn't laughable, um, it would be quite uh, tragic. Or the other way around, if it wasn't so tragic, it would be laughable. This polarization, everything is depicted as cowboys and Indians. There's no such room for nuances, for gray areas. You're either Democrat and anti-Republican or Republican, anti-Democrat. It seems very childish in many ways. The gray areas. See, the, the devil or God. I mean, and it affects our entire society because on a personal level, you know, I have many friends, many of them I agree with, some things I agree with, some things I don't agree with. It seems like we've forgotten that all of us are fallible, that we're all flawed, and we all have our share of mistakes. And there's no such thing as a savior that's going to just be perfect. I mean... My theory is this, that we've been living so long in the world of video <clears throat> and virtual reality, and thank God we haven't had to fight wars, real wars, so our values have become very mushy and very uncrystallized. You know, so everything is either video games or sports or Hollywood or Broadway, living, vis- living vicariously through, through um, actors and actresses. I mean, so much of it is voyeurism that we have uh, created that type of like um, extreme black and white situation of everything instead of understanding that life is much more complex than that. So it's important to just step back and realize we're vulnerable human beings and each of us in our personal lives has our share of virtue, but we all have our vices, the mistakes we all make. So... I can begin listing all mine, and I'm sure you can list yours. The point here is not a confession. The point is really to confess a bigger statement, and that is that we all have our share of mistakes. They always begin with our subjectivity. The fact is we're biased, we're prejudiced about everything, starting with our own self-love, with minimizing things that are close to us, and maximizing things that are distant from us. It's much easier to criticize someone else than yourself. It's as simple as that. This is not about self being self-critical, it's just being about honesty. And honesty begins by recognizing we're all subjective human beings. Subjective means that we have self-interest. Beginning with our own self-interest, our families, the people we love, our business interests. This is why we have the concept of, be, of recusing yourself in a given situation where an objective truth is necessary. You have to be fully transparent, full disclosure, and declare your interests. Declare that you cannot really be a judge in this case because you have you have vested interest in the result of this case. And that is the first step toward objectivity. So none of us are objective purely, but we can be honest about our situation. The same thing with uh, the, and the mistakes that come from that are often in that context where we will perhaps hurt somebody, and then either go into denial, cover up, minimize it, and or find someone else to blame. These are the common mistakes, the common errors. Some of them are intentional and malicious, frankly, and some of them are not intentional, and they're inadvertent, but they all exist in our lives. So the concept that we're looking for perfection is an illusion. There is no such thing as perfection. Perfection is in the domain of God. That's perhaps why we turn to a God whose attributes are perfect, the perfect beauty, the perfect love, the perfect discipline, the perfect intelligence. But the rest of us, we all have our imperfections. But here's the key thing. Trust, which is the key to all relationships, is not built on perfection. It's built on accountability. Accountability. Mistakes, we'll all make mistakes. But the question is, are you accountable afterwards? Will you acknowledge it? Will you do something to repair it? Or only because you were caught, and that's why you acknowledge it, because you have no choice. That's where connections are made. Not on perfection, but on accountability. And let's talk about that a bit more. So they say, to err is human. 
to forgive is divine. Er, because we'll all make our share of mistakes. Some of them, as I said before, are novice mistakes that happen when we're younger, simply inexperienced. Some are ones that come specifically because we become experienced and more jaded and more cynical. And we sometimes lose some of our moral conscience, let's be honest. And especially when you look around at a world around you where many people are cutting corners and doing all kinds of things. So you say, hey, you know, everybody's doing it. And therefore we start losing that high ground, that higher standard that usually when we're more idealistic, we embrace. So each of us has to look at ourselves. But I believe today, especially with technology and the media, it really makes things problematic. For all its blessings, and I'm using technology right now, it has tremendous blessings. For all its blessings, it also, as we used to always say, and maybe they still say it, about computers, junk in, junk out. If you put junk into a computer, the computer will crunch the numbers quicker than ever, so there'll be much more junk than you've ever imagined. If you put good things in, it'll also amplify those good things. So it all depends on what you come to the table with. If you're perpetuating a rumor, gossip, slander, hurting someone, or these, uh, all this misinformation and disinformation of false narratives, fake news, technology will make things far worse because it immediately magnifies it, amplifies it, broadcasts it, and now it's become millions of people, if not billions, are all saying it. So it's no longer just being contained. So when, this, when it comes to these type of like character assassination, where instead of acknowledging that each of us have our strengths and our weaknesses, um, instead we just only talk about my strengths, I'm perfect, and that person is imperfect. I will bring deliverance, salvation to the world, and that person will bring only destruction. And then that's amplified, and it's presented and, uh, and produced in beautiful advertising, and so on. And it also feeds into the people wanting blood. You got yourself a real, real mess. Because then people start thinking these, these, the, the, these distortions become facts, because everybody's saying it. It's now everywhere. And you no longer can distinguish between right and wrong, between truth and falsity. It would be very refreshing if the both presidential candidates would begin each of their speeches, say something for 30 seconds positive about your opponent, something that you find is a quality that they have, and then go on to uh, describe your qualities or the things that you think you'll be better than they. Just as a civil a gesture, just as something to just introduce that there is another side to all of this, which is being human. But it doesn't feed the ratings, let's be honest. I think I mentioned this. I was invited, invited quite often to be, make a media appearance, you know, to get on a show, uh, prime, prime time or other times, and often you have another guest that is an opposing op opinion. So I was, I was called not long ago to comment on something that people felt the, the producer felt was anti-Semitic, and they wanted me to call out that person as an anti-Semite and accuse them. So they asked me in the pre-interview whether I would do that. I said, I don't like to give anyone, label anyone unless I know who they are. To call someone anti-Semite, I would like to meet them. I'd like to at least hear what they're saying and not just from a third party. So you're not going to call, I said, I'm happy to, if you ask me a question, I could say that sounds like an anti-Semitic statement or anti-Semitic act, but to call someone anti-Semitic, no, I'm not ready to say that. And then the biggest thing was, that was, okay, fine. And second thing is, they want me to yell. That am I ready to argue and yell at my uh, the other guests that will be with me? I said, that's not my style, I don't yell. I'll be happy to make a persuasive argument I'll, I will not mince words, I'll be, I'll be uh, blunt, and I'll be direct, but I'm not a yeller. And they would not book me for that program, which I wasn't insulted by, because, frankly, well, they wanted blood. They wanted gladiators, because that's what the ratings, that's what people want to see. They want to see two people yelling at each other. And I know that's purely entertainment, or worse, and rather than really getting, I said, I'd rather make a case for it and try to appeal to people's intelligence, to p try to appeal to people's hearts, something that they can work with instead of who's louder, and, and which is instant gratification, a sugar, it's sugar high, has nothing to do with reality. 
So we're living in a world, unfortunately, that has become, low, the common denominator is lower and lower, reaching the people with the least lowest attention span and feeding them. And then we have now this vicious cycle where everybody's blaming, everyone's pointing fingers, the blind leading the blind. The media is saying, well, that's what people want to see. The people are saying that's what the media is feeding us. Advertisers say, well, you know, whatever people are watching, wherever there are more eyeballs. So we have ourselves a mess, basically with no one really setting any higher standards. And if that's why I'm trying to bring it back to the human level. Let's just talk about our, uh, our shortcomings, some of our challenges. And we all have them. We all have them, in the, especially in the area of relationships and emotions and so on. These are the areas where we have our biggest blind spots. And it's perfectly fine. I think it's quite healthy to talk about it. You know, awareness, as we say, is half the cure. Awareness, awareness of a problem is actually half the cure. Ignoring it or denying it, it makes the problem worse. It's as simple as that. You know, imagine you have a little, God forbid, a person has a little infection. And you ignore it. It begins to fester. And then what happens? It starts spreading and it becomes, God forbid, a cancer. You could have nipped it in the bud, but you ignored it. So the key thing is awareness. Now, I always love the story, the Chelem story, the Chelem farmer. Chelem was this town in Poland. They say actually there were very smart people there, but the neighbors, resentful neighbors, created this whole folklore called the Parables of Chelem. Uh, the Fools of Chelem. Like, you know what they call Polish jokes or whatever you want to call. And so here's the story about the, the farmer of Chelem. Well, just to give you a taste of Chelem, one of the big recovery stories in healing today is someone's looking for his keys at night and he's um, searching here, there, he can't find his keys. So a friend, a neighbor comes over and says, let me help you. He says, where did you lose them? Let's retrace it. So he points 100 yards away. 100 yards away. He says, so why are you looking for the keys here? He says, well, here's where the light is shining. It's a classic healing recovery story that we don't look at where the real problems are. We look at where the light is shining, which, of course, is never where the problem is. So there's the story of the, the farmer of Chelem. The farmer of Chelem was a, uh, it was, had a farm. Chelem was a little town, so you can imagine the farm was really tiny, but it was his. It was his baby. He inherited it from his family, from his parents, from his grandparents, great-grandparents. So he knew every grain of soil, and it was like his, his, his child. One day he gets a visitor, a cousin, a cousin from a big city farmer in the United States, farm in Iowa, you know, thousands of acres. Anyway, he gives him a royal tour of his Chelem little farm. They sit down to dinner. The Chelem farmer asks his big city cousin, so tell me, what do you think about my farm here in Chelem? He says, your farm, it's so nice and cute, but it's so tiny. The Chelem farmer's taken aback. He's insulted, it's so tiny. How big is your farm in, in, in Iowa? You know, he like challenges him. Um, so the, the Iowa farmer, you know, the, the whole Chelem is smaller than his farm. So how does he describe this to a small town, little shtetl farmer, what his farm is like? So he looks for a point of reference. He says, I'll tell you how long big it is. It takes me all day to travel with my tractor from one end of the farm to the next. Suddenly the Chelem farmer's eyes and composure change. With empathy and compassion, he looks at his cousin, the Iowa farmer, the big city farmer, and says to him, don't feel bad, cousin. I once had a tractor like that too. So, he wasn't being malicious, he wasn't being cute, he wasn't being funny. His scope, his perspective, his subjective experience was of a little farmer, Chelem. He hears it takes all day to travel with a tractor. He didn't think it was the size of the farm. It must be the tractor. So he reminded him of an old shmata jalopy that he once had that took him all day to crank up, to move from here to there. He thought it was the vehicle, not the farm. Couldn't fathom that size. So if someone asks you a question, are you subjective, objective, narrow-minded, close-minded? Very few people are going to mark the box closed-minded, narrow-minded, subjective. Because part of being subjective is it makes you think you're objective. But we're only as objective as our perspectives allow us. If I were to ask you, what does the horizon look like? If you're standing in a valley, you'll give me one answer. If you're standing in a plateau, you'll give me a second answer. If you're standing 10 feet up on a mountain, third answer. And if you're on top of Mount Everest, a fourth answer. 
Which one's true? They're all true, but with one major disclaimer. And that is from my perspective. From my perspective, standing in a valley, this is what the horizon looks like. It's all perspective. It's all your, the instruments that you're using. So that is the key to all real growth and honesty. From my perspective. Now, once I hear your perspective, and tell me, the, tell me the full perspective. I want to hear, make a case for it. But you've been honest. And instead of trying to paint a picture of a false picture, a distorted picture of perfection, of reality, you're not telling me reality. You're telling me how you perceive reality, which is perfectly fine. But you've added that key humble word, I perceive it as such from my point of view. This is what's missing in our world today. And I submit that the reason for it is primarily insecurity. When you're an insecure person, you hold on and you create these false narratives. Secure people have no problem coexisting with someone that disagrees with you. You don't have to be wrong for me to be right. Why do you have to be evil for me to embrace what I think is good? That, that is a problem when you see that. I remember once meeting someone who just wanted to argue and debate. But before I met him, I asked a friend of his, what do you, what's, what's the story with this guy? So he said to me, he hides his ignorance with his arrogance. Tells you the whole story. So we live in a world of insecurity and couple that with the technology and the media that like, love the circus and at the expense of all of us. And what we really need is getting back to the basics. You have children. What's important to your children? Most of the presidential politics, they don't care a damn about. Who really cares? Let them talk about policies. No one's talking about policies. I would challenge anyone in the United States today to tell me the difference between Kamala Harris's policies for the economic future of our country and Donald Trump's policies. I would like you to articulate what is the different approach to foreign relations, to how to deal with the Middle East, how to deal with Putin in Russia. None of that is being said. Platitudes, platitudes, and more platitudes. And, that, and people seem to be accepting it. The media is accepting it. Where's the discretion? Where's the skepticism? Where are the questions? And I'm saying this across the board. I don't care whether you're pro-Trump or anti-Trump, pro-Harris, anti-Harris. It's irrelevant because we're talking about something far bigger here. Finding the truth in our lives and acknowledging that we're all in it together and we're all human beings and we all make our mistakes. And at the same time, we all are expected to be accountable. Accountable. And that's where you find trust. You know, I have dedicated my life to try, and to try to find the truth. Can't say I'm always successful. I can't say that I don't have my own blind spots. And I'm sure I do. And I hope you point them out to me. And I hope you're open to someone pointing it out to you. That's how intelligent people uh, dis communicate. We are always growing. We're always learning. Yesterday's horizon was based on that perspective. You climb the mountain, you'll see broader horizons. So my friends, I hope these words are into your heart as they come from my heart. May, may we all share these ideas. And please, this has been Simon Jacobson. Meaningfullife.com is our website. Please, if you thought this is meaningful, share it with others. Subscribe to these offerings. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your feedback, your comments, your rebuttals, and pointing out anything you feel that I may have said that you think is wrong. And you can respectfully disagree. And we can discuss it. But I'd like to always keep it away from platitudes and sticking to just the cliches and rhetoric that is not defined by substance. Substance with some form of a case behind it. Hopefully we can make a difference if we demand it. If we can create that grassroots type of effort, the butterfly effect that it has. And using technology, we can amplify the demand for higher truths the demand for more objectivity, the demand for more accountability, and the demand for being more civil and more human in our, in our interactions and our communications. Be blessed and be well, everyone. Thank you so much.